I'm a chemist working in the Origin of Life at the Medical Research Council in Cambridge, UK. Is that an important question? I think it's one of the biggest questions in science. Oh, the origin of life. How life started on Earth and whether there's life elsewhere. If you study the origin of life on Earth, does that tell you anything about the origin of life elsewhere? I think, in a sense, it tells you, if you find out how it happened on Earth, that tells you how it could happen elsewhere. It doesn't tell you whether it does happen elsewhere or whether there are other ways in which it could happen elsewhere. But it gives you some constraint. Let's, let's divide this into, let's suppose you find out how it works here and you say, ah, that must be how it works elsewhere, versus, ah, here's how it worked here, that's probably not how it works elsewhere. What kind of evidence would divide your results into those two categories? So I think if you found evidence that very, very simple molecules, such as hydrogen cyanide, underwent chemistry in response to environmental situations which are presumably common on all sorts of different planets, if you found that that inevitably produced a set of molecules, and that set of molecules is what gave rise to our biology, yes. then you'd have to argue that because HCN is going to be everywhere, mm. and those conditions are very common, that same building, set of building blocks could be produced elsewhere. What it doesn't say is whether or not a different set of building blocks might be produced from a different starting material under different conditions. So we don't have any constraint on that. My inherent feeling for what it's worth at the moment is that the chemistry from HCN to make the building blocks that we see in our biology is very, very persuasive, very convincing chemistry. And I'd be very surprised if that chemistry hadn't played out somewhere else. So if going, what, uh, going from the building blocks over to a living system mm. is something that we, we really don't understand. So it could be that there are lots of planets out there with the building blocks that went no further than the building blocks. Well, so if life on Earth were made out of unobtainium, for example, then you would say, hey, it's probably not elsewhere. But is there, a, is there an equivalent to unobtainium for not the ingredients, but the recipe? I mean, do you have any indication that the recipe for life made out of these monomers that are very common is somehow rare or that's, something I'll, uh, easy? That's a very, very good question. And I think the, the unobtainium is, if I pronounced it properly, <laughs> is actually the particular set of conditions that we're being sort of, not forced, but we're being sort of persuaded by the chemistry to invoke. In particular, if you want to make a large number of organic molecules, you really have a problem if you try and do it in a single vessel or a single body of water, because it can just produce a mess. But if you actually manage to split it up a little bit, you might be able to make all of the components and then subsequently mix them. And we invoke doing this in a few streams, different streams with different reaction histories, ultimately converging. So if the number of streams, let's say, is one or two, it would be quite easy to imagine it occurring again. But if you've got to have six streams with very well-defined reaction histories, mm. even though it's based on HCM, it could be that that's just numerically unlikely to have played out in exactly the same way anywhere else, even given the huge numbers of planets that are presumably out there in the galaxy and the universe. Okay, John, so are we alone? So 10 to 11 stars in our galaxy, 10 to 11 galaxies in the observable universe, 10 to 22, because each star on average has one planet. It's whether we're alone or not, it simply boils down to a, a numbers game. Well, when if, I ask you that. If the unobtainable mm -hmm. from your previous question really is seven streams, it could be that the chances of that occurring, even given the number of different environments on any one planet, it could be that that is such that we are alone. Uh, and until we actually get some better feeling on that, I think. Although it's a fascinating question and one everyone wants to hear an answer on, I think the answer is an uninformed answer. So when I asked you the question, are we alone, what did you interpret in the, with the word we? We as the, the life on this planet. The life this, on this planet. Is this the only planet with life? Because half the people I've asked when I asked that question, we means we homo sapiens. Okay. I, I think I'm much more, despite the fact the British are not very inclusive at the moment, I think I'm just a bit more inclusive than oh. that. Okay, now have you ever seen a UFO? Uh, I've not seen a UFO. No, every flying object you've ever seen was identified. Uh, every flying object I've seen was something that I could uh, connect with something that I've seen probably on the ground no. and seen and walked around. So, so you've never seen a UFO? Have you ever as been far, as far as I know, I've never seen Have you ever been abducted by aliens? I have never been abducted by aliens. Or how would you know? As far as how I know. Right. As far <laughs> as I know. <laughs> All right. Now, if I gave you $100 billion to try to answer the question, are we alone, how would you spend it? 
I think the best way of spending money to answer these questions is to spend it on the ground by on studying the, the chemistry mm. and actually getting to understand the chemistry of how life started. So how life started is your focus and that's where you think the best progress can be made? Yes. If we, if we want to know whether it's happened more than once, let's find out how it did actually happen with the one biology that we know about. Mm -hmm. Once we've done that, then we can, we'll have a grounding point to compare ideas and, and so on about other planets, other chemistries. We'll at least have something solid, grounded. Now, spending 100 billion on chemistry, you wouldn't find enough chemists to spend 100 billion on. So you could perhaps spend a billion on chemistry and then spend more money on astronomy to start getting a better data set on what exoplanets look like, what are the range of conditions, and use that in two ways. One to sort of know, inform us more about the Earth's own history, because I'm sure comparative planetology is going to tell us lots about early Earth history, but also to get an idea about how common or how rare are the conditions that prevailed on the early Earth relative to the conditions that have prevailed or are prevailing on exoplanets. Usually we talk about life going from simple to complex, but if there is a very complex recipe, then you're not starting with simple, you're starting with complex. So complexity in general terms is, I think, in the eye of the beholder. And in organic chemistry, for example, a lot of people view the sort of molecules that we play with as being complex, because when they look at them and I say, I'm going to hide that molecule now, I want you to redraw it, they can't redraw it because it, it's difficult for them to remember, mm -hmm. and they equate that with complex. However, if the molecules we're dealing with self-assemble from things as simple as hydrogen sulfide, mm -hmm. then the molecules we're dealing with aren't complex. So complexity really does depend on how you look at it. There are some people who want to quantify complexity mathematically. I think that's a crazy game. I think the simplest way of describing complexity is that complexity is those molecules which don't self-assemble from very simple precursors under environmental conditions. Now, when you say self-assemble, I guess that precludes the use of the word Darwinian evolution. So, another good question. I, I tend to think of Darwinian evolution kicking in once you have systems based upon polymers and the number of permutational variants of those polymers is very, very high. So one or other polymer sequence can be selected over another, which would otherwise be relatively similar to each other. In the early phase of the chemistry, I think the molecules that are generated chemically are deterministic which is to say you have the same starting material, the same conditions, you always get the same set of molecules. It's a given. So when do you change from deterministic chemistry to, I guess, uh, what, non-deterministic polymers with information in them or something? I think it's, you, you can produce short polymers, which will still be deterministic, because if you had short polymers, you'd always have representation of all possible sequences. And so the overall system made one way would be the same as the overall system made right. in a different place. Whereas once you get beyond a certain length, such that you're now not being able to sample all the sequences because of Avogadro's number mm. considerations, yeah. then you take exactly the same monomers on two different exoplanets, allow them to assemble into polymers, and you will have different polymeric sequences simply because you're not able to sample all sequence variants. At that point, I think it's contingent and not deterministic. Uh, so which point of that, again, that, that's where you get long polymers? Once you get to a length, such that in the that amount of material you have, mm -hmm. not, every not every sequence permutation can be present. And that's in what type of volume? Within a in, cup, a teaspoon, well, a nanomole? In, in the volume, which is the volume essentially where you're invoking the chemistry to take place. So if it's a small lake, for mm. example, mm -hmm. or you know, chemists tend to think of on a slightly smaller scale than perhaps the planetary scientists or the geochemistry. Mm. But, and biologists probably think on an even smaller scale. Some people ask, hey, are you making any progress in the origin of life? And most people say, oh, no, we're not at all. But I guess you would say, yes, we are making lots of progress. Have you made a lot of progress? So I like to use this quote from Churchill. This is not the end. This is not even the beginning of the end. But we are perhaps approaching the end of the beginning. Mm -hmm. I think the reason for borrowing that quote is because it recognizes that there's still a very long way to go. But I do think we have made some progress. And you're fighting a war with your own ignorance? Of course we're fighting a war with our own ignorance. <laughs> and, okay. and perhaps with the ignorance okay. of others okay. as well. But. All right. 
Uh, so if I give you $100 million, billion, you said you'd spend a billion on chemistry and the rest of it on missions to look at biosignatures of planets? Not necessarily looking at biosignatures. I would certainly survey exoplanets and try and get a very good impression, the best impression I could get of the range of different atmospheric compositions, try and infer the range of different mm -hmm. compositions of the planets themselves, get mm -hmm. a better idea of how planets form, because I think that will back inform our knowledge of how our solar system arose and how it progressed over time. So what is your favorite solution to Fermi's paradox? Where is everyone? If there's life elsewhere in the universe, if it's everywhere, then many th people think it will, have, it will evolve technological civilization and then colonize the galaxy. But if that were the case, we, they would already be here. But they're not. So, so what's your favorite solution? I, I think there is this assumption sometimes amongst the chemists that once you get to the point that you have a living system, that the rest is just Darwinian and you're bound to end up with intelligent systems. But I think the transition from unicellular to multicellular organisms is actually potentially even as difficult as the transition from non-living to living. So it could be that we're here as a result of a series of very, very difficult steps. And that compounds the problem of whether there's life elsewhere and adds to it, says there might, even if there is life elsewhere, the chance of it being intelligent life might be you know, a tiny fraction of life out there might be intelligent. So it could be, again, the numbers game could be there is no other intelligent life, so it's no surprise that we've not detected it. You are doing chemistry to try to figure out how the building blocks of life formed, like RNA, for example. Is that right? We want to, we want to know chemically how life started, or how life could have started. And we've started out by studying the synthesis of the building blocks, because we figure if we know which building blocks were present, uh -huh we'll be able to have a better stab at sampling the possible polymers and macromolecules you could assemble from them. So you're doing pre-LUCA molecular evolution, would you say that? We are away, away from LUCA. LUCA is an advanced organism with translation, with F180 PAs or some similar sort of energetic system based on transport of ions of protons across a membrane, it's got a genetic, it's a hugely advanced, evolved system. Mm -hmm. The origin of life and LUCA are two completely separate entities, and anybody who argues that LUCA tells you something directly about the origin of life, you know, has got it wrong in my book. Now, I know this is a difficult question and maybe doesn't have an answer, but uh, a lot of people would l desperately like to know how long it would take to go from the type of chemical synthesis that you're working with and LUCA. Because if we can find LUCA very, very early on in the history of life, then we can say, oh, and by the way, we need 100 million years to produce a LUCA. Now, what you just said was LUCA is complicated, so presumably that means it takes a while for a LUCA to evolve out of what you're working with. So how long, do you have a time frame for that? So I think there's a huge amount of evolution necessary to get to LUCA. I, I'm not an expert on rates of evolution, and I do know something about chemistry, but I'm not an expert on how chemistry can progress to life because we've not observed it, no one has. So there are a lot of uncertainties there. What I would say is that we do have some knowledge about timings of certain things because we know about the stability of molecules. So we know about the stability of RNA, for example. And if RNA is going to degrade on the time scale of years, I wouldn't want to hang around for 100 million years because my RNA is going to you know, be degrading. Of course, you can synthesize to repair the, the, the damage and cycle things, and we think that's important. But I think the chemistry to, the, from this chemistry to a living system might be a very fast transition, very rapid. But my guess is to go from a very simple cellular system to LUCA is going to be quite a long period of evolutionary change. Right, you use the word living system, and on your, in one of your plots you put aliveness. Is somebody here that you're going to, is she here? Yeah, she's here. Yeah. Oh, she, so where is she? she? Yeah, I just saw her wandering over there. Okay, so, so how about we'll finish off in yeah. about a minute. Yeah, okay. Okay, so... Uh, a lot, you use the word life. What is life? I mean, do you, do, you have, do you need a working definition for that to figure out how life got started? So I think different people will be convinced by different criteria about what constitutes life. And partly to accommodate that, we actually view it as a sort of variable. And so I like to think of the transition from non-living to living, going through intermediate stages, which are not completely alive. Then most people wouldn't accept them as being alive, but you've acquired some attributes which ultimately, collectively comprise the attributes of a living system. So, for example, you might have cellular division without nucleic acid replication. 
replication. You might have nucleic acid replication without cellular division, but you're a step towards the overall system. Mm. So I think having aliveness as a variable is just a convenient way of avoiding the endless debate about people quibbling about definitions. NASA's definition of alive doesn't work for a mule, for example. Mm. You know, other people's definition of alive doesn't work for other things. Let's not quibble. Just say, you know, we pretty much recognise the difference between what's alive and what's dead, but, or what's not alive, but we do recognise that being alive has many attributes, and the chance that you're going to get all of the attributes in one go seems very slim to me, so let's acquire them over time, and why not view the intermediate stages as being partially alive? Are viruses alive? I don't know. I think viruses, in the presence of their host cells, contribute to the aliveness of the host cells. Okay. And are we alone? Are we alone? I don't know, John, <laughs> is the short and honest answer.